My husband's job keeps him on the road a lot, so we didn't have much family time. But he's super committed to his work, and I've always admired that and rolled with it. Then, out of the blue, he gave me a call. When I answered, he sounded all mixed up, saying, "Something's up with our front door. My key's not working." Without missing a beat, I said, "Oh, I moved out yesterday." I shipped your stuff over to your parents' house. What? I could practically hear his jaw drop over the line. Hold on, would you do this without giving me a heads up? I started explaining. It's because you. Upon hearing my story, his voice went colder than I've ever heard. I'm Rachel, thirty-three years old. I'm a nurse, hustling every day. It's just me, my husband Josh, and our little girl Karen at home in our apartment. Josh and I, we go way back from our college days. He was the guy everyone noticed, super driven, always on his game, and a total catch. I sometimes wonder how a regular girl like me snagged him. We stayed strong post college, and fast forward, he popped the question. And we got married five years back. Karen popped into our lives the following year. Our daily life is pretty smooth sailing, with barely any squabbles. To an outsider, we probably look like a dream team. But there is a little wrinkle. Josh runs this small company and is all in. He works late nights. He even slept at the office when things were hectic. He does remember to send gifts for birthday or Christmas, but he's never there for actual moments. He's flaked on us a bunch because work's pulled him away. I get his work's intense, so I try not to sweat the small stuff. But it tugs at my heartstrings when Karen says, "I guess Daddy's not coming back home tonight." And here's the kicker: for the crazy hour he works. His paycheck's kind of light. We are not scraping by or anything, but I foot most of our bills. He did once say, "Look, business is tough right now with the economy and all. I hate dumping everything on you. I really do." I told him, "No need to feel bad. I'm just worried about you burning out." Trust me, I'm tougher than I look. Stick with me a bit longer. Once things level out, you can ditch that grueling nurse job. He seemed genuinely remorseful, and honestly, that made me second guess my concerns. I figured maybe I'm being too hard on him with the money thing. I chose to back him up even more, but then something went down that rocked my world. That particular day was total mayhem at the hospital, with emergency left and right. Doctors were on edge, and us nurses were hustling nonstop. Being the newbie, I was still trying to fit in. Just when you think things couldn't get crazier, a bunch of critically injured patients rolled in. Among them was this toddler, maybe two, out cold after a car accident. His probable mom was with him, looking white as a sheet. Over and over, she pleaded, "Stay with me, Dan." My heart just broke, thinking of my own kid. All I could do was hope and pray for him. The ER was buzzing, and I was right there, assisting in surgery. Every medical professional at the scene was giving it their all to save this little kid's life. A few hours in, we successfully wrapped up the surgery. I headed over to the family waiting area to update them on the boy's condition. As I got closer, I was riding high on relief that the little guy was okay, but I wasn't ready for what came next. As I neared the room, I overheard the woman chatting with a guy, likely her husband. I was about to jump in and update them. When I saw the guy she was with, hold on, was that? Yep, there he was, 
my husband, Josh. I'd recognize him anywhere, and he was even wearing the suit I picked out for his business trips. Eve's dropping a bid. His voice was unmistakable. The call about Dan's accident nearly gave me a heart attack. Thank goodness he's all right. I'm sorry. I just looked away for a second, and then he was in the street. Hey, I've been gone a lot. Leaving you to do the heavy lifting with parenting, I can't put this on you. Let's just be grateful he's okay. He then pulled her into a hug. My brain was an overdrive. What the heck was happening? Why was Josh there? Did he just say parenting? Does that mean? As much as I didn't want to think it, the pieces seemed to fit one way. Josh had another life I didn't know about. After that surprise, I was a mess at work, slipping up left and right, which wasn't my style. The head nurse didn't let it slide. I took her critique. I mean, she was right, but I could tell she was worried. Rachel, you're off today. What's up? Taking a deep breath, I told her. She offered to do a little digging for me and suggested I go home for the day. My head wasn't in the game at home either, and just as I was piecing things together, Josh called. Hey, everything's okay there? Playing it cool, I responded. He came back with, "Look, something's come up with my trip. I'll be away another week. Can you hold down the fort with Karen?" The nerve of him! But I didn't want to tip him off without more info, so I played along. Got it. Do what you've got to do. Just stay safe, okay? He sounded genuinely thankful, saying, "I owe you one." After we hung up, I gave myself a little pep talk. I didn't want to believe the worst, but I couldn't just brush this off. For me and Karen. I needed answers. It was go time. Come next morning, the head nurse had a scoop. Turns out she's gotten close with the boy's mom, Jennifer. Jennifer works at a bar, and that's where she ran into Josh. He made the first move. They hit it off, and before long, they were married. Especially after she got pregnant. And according to the head nurse. Jennifer is clueless about Josh's other life. I thanked her for the information. Seriously, thank you for this. Sorry to drag you into my drama. I've got it from here, she said. Any time you need to chat, I'm here. I am lucky to have a great boss like her. Wanting to talk to Jennifer, I popped into the boy's room and saw her right there, constantly attending to him. She was comforting the kid who was restless and unable to get up. It's okay. When you're all better, we'll go out and play. Even though she's involved with my husband, she's a mom first. Seeing her like that, I just couldn't blame her. I get the whole mom thing. When I had a break, I went up to her. Hi there. It's great to see your son getting better. Here's hoping he bounces back soon. Oh, Rachel, right? Thank you. I'm just so relieved he's okay. You look worn out. Make sure you're not pushing yourself too hard. How about taking a little break? I led her to the break room and decided to probe about Josh. Your husband's really there for you guys. I see him with your son daily. He's super involved. Her reply threw me for a loop. Well, he's often traveling for work as a photographer. Hold up, photographer. Did I ever see Josh with a camera? Wait, he did buy a high-end one for Karen's preschool event. He must have spun that into this photographer story. I felt dumb for buying his line about just wanting to snap pictures of our daughter. Turns out, according to Jennifer. He's got some debt, and once that's settled, they're getting officially married. 
While he griped about making less due to the economy, he was also bankrolling her family. No wonder his funds seemed stretched. He was fooling me. Here I was, thinking I was helping him through tough times. It's not just me. Even Jennifer got played by him. I'll never let that slide. A week later, I get a call from Josh post his business trip. He sounded totally lost. Rachel, something's up with our front door. My key's not working. Think it's jammed. Can you let me in? Sorry, can't do that. We're not there. Hold up. Aren't you off today? Where'd you go? I shot back with, "We moved out yesterday. I sent our stuff to my folks' place. Your things have been shipped to your parents. Best check in with them." He sounded blindsided. "What? You left? Why on earth?" I heard everything from Jennifer, juggling two families, huh? Explains the small paychecks. If you're supporting two households, of course you're broke. You're consistently inconsistent. Whoa! How did you find out about Jennifer? He sounded flat out frantic. Hello, I work at the hospital where your other kid had his surgery. It dawned on him his son landed in my workplace. I had told him I switched hospitals, but it must have slipped his mind. Figures with all his sneaking. Cutting ties with someone like that, the sooner the better. So I ditched the house lease under my name and went back to my parents with my daughter. Once he pieced everything together, Josh was falling over himself to apologize. Give me a chance to explain. I'm at work right now. We'll handle this with our attorneys. With that, I ended the call. No point in hearing excuses over the phone. But then, to my surprise, he showed up at the hospital. Where's my wife? He yelled, causing a scene. Thankfully, the waiting room was empty at the time. I filled the head nurse in, took a breather, and we headed to a private room. Josh immediately started with his apologies. She kept coming on to me. And one thing led to another, but you're the one I truly love. I promise I'll end it with her. Please forgive me. I couldn't believe he tried to pin this on Jennifer. How could he think of just ditching someone he'd been lying to? It's not as easy as just breaking up. You two have a kid. How do you plan on stepping up for that child? He looked desperate. That kid isn't mine. She's saying it is, but it's from her previous relationship. Suddenly, a voice rang out. What did you just say? Jennifer had been hiding behind the door and listening this whole time. Earlier, I told her straight up that I was his wife. At first, she didn't buy it, but our wedding photos and marriage certificate convinced her. She'd apologized profusely, even offered to compensate me. But honestly, I couldn't be mad at her. She was also blindsided by Josh's lies. My plan was to get evidence of their fling from her to use against Josh. Seeing her now, Josh went pale. She challenged him. Are you really saying Dan isn't yours? I've never been with anyone else. Want a paternity test to prove it? Josh couldn't meet her gaze, and she seemed to be telling the truth. Both of us gave him a hard stare. After an awkward silence, he came out with, "I care about both of you. I want to support both families. Can't we just keep things as they are?" Jennifer and I were floored by his audacity. As I was processing his nonsense, Jennifer beat me to the punch. Are you for real? Just now you denied Dan was yours. We're done, and trust me, I'll be getting child support from you. She stormed out, leaving Josh and me. I took a deep breath and said, 
I'm with her. After all this, you can't expect things to go back to normal. I truly feel for Jennifer and Dan being fooled by you. We are getting a divorce, and you better be ready to pay up. But, Rachel, please, I don't want to lose you or Karen. How can I trust a word you say? You just threw Jennifer and Dan under the bus. This will be handled by our attorneys. Leave, or I'm calling security. He walked out, tears streaming down his face. A month later, Josh and I were officially done. I got a one-time payment of $600,000 for the pain and suffering and another $300,000 for child support. Looks like Jennifer did too. Between that and losing focus at work, Josh's business tanked. Last I heard, he borrowed from some shady people and is now grinding away in a factory with some rough-looking supervisors. As for me and my daughter, we are staying with my folks, living a peaceful life. They dote on Karen, and she's thriving. Through all this, my main goal is to be there for my daughter and be the best mom I can be. After I gave birth, my smirking husband claims DNA test proves it's not his child. So in front of the whole family, I exposed his devious plan. It's been a month since our baby girl arrived. Out of family gathering, out of the blue, my husband stood up and said something crazy. Hey everyone, I've got some news. Sadly, we are getting a divorce. Our parents and his sister were totally blindsided. And so was I. Hold on. What's this about? I burst out, clutching our baby, my voice shaking. He pointed right at me and said, She's the reason. She's been seeing someone else behind my back. This came out of nowhere. His folks shot me a look of disbelief. Jumping to my defense, I shot back. I've never cheated on you. With this smarky expression, my husband took out an envelope. I had my suspicions, so I got a DNA test for our baby. The results are right here. This baby isn't mine. She stepped out of our marriage, so we're done. The report he flashed read, Parent-child relationship, not confirmed. Every set of eyes turned to me. Their faces pale. I was at my wit's end. How could he do this to me in front of everyone? But I thought, I've got something for you, just you wait. His big plan was about to blow up in his face. My name is Janet. I'm a 28-year-old working mom. After college, I got a job at my dream publishing house. They put me on their women's magazine team, and I gave it my all. Years went by, and it hit me. I hadn't dated anyone in over half a decade. Friends and colleagues nagged me to shake things up. So I tried out a speed dating event. That's where I met Simon, my future husband. Everyone wanted to talk with him that evening because he was tall and dressed sharp. But for some reason, after chatting with me, he liked me. We hit it off and exchanged numbers. Things took off from there, and after a year, he proposed to me. Janet, will you marry me? Let's make this last forever. Oh, Simon, this means everything. He was your typical office guy at a mid-sized company. Truth be told, my paycheck was bigger than his since I was with a big company. But hey, it didn't faze me. I felt we had the right stuff to make it work. Meeting my parents to talk marriage, they were all in. Over at Simon's place, his parents got all teary-eyed and gushed. Simon struck gold with you. We were totally on board with the wedding. Janet, look out for Simon, okay? His sister, who's big into sports and teaches PE, cracked up and said, 
My baby brother can be a handful, but you've got this. It felt great to see his family was so happy and supportive. Fast forward, Simon and I got married, and our journey as a married couple began. Married life was pretty good. I was putting in some serious hours at work, but Simon was on top of things at home. On weekends, we either hit the town or made something in the kitchen, just enjoying each other. And as you'd guess with any new couple, things were sizzling in the romance department. A year of this, and something nice happened. I was expecting. Simon, I think we are pregnant. For real? That's amazing. Both our families were over the moon, and it was nothing but happiness all around. But then, morning sickness hit me like a freight train. It was like being stuck on a rocky board all day long. With me getting sick even when there was nothing left, I couldn't go to work, so I filled in my boss and decided to stay home until I felt better. Good thing my boss, who'd been through the whole baby thing herself, totally got it. But with me around the house more, Simon started getting a bit weird. So, you're handling things at home now, right? I've always thought housework was such a drag. Well, I would do my best, but this morning sickness is no joke. I need your support like before. What? You're not working or handling chores? Isn't that a bit much? His words caught me off guard. Don't you see? I'm pregnant with our child. It's not like I want to feel like this. I just wish you'd get it. Okay, okay. I hear you. But it feels like you're using the pregnancy as a free pass for everything. The way he brushed me off made me uneasy. From then on, while Simon did chores, if I nagged him, he didn't seem to care about how I was feeling and just kept on with his usual routine. In fact, he was even more vocal about his dislike for housework, and even with my rentless morning sickness, he still expected intimacy like nothing had changed. Hey Janet, how about tonight? I can't. The morning sickness is killing me. All right, all right, got it. He turned away, clearly frustrated. I thought he'd be there for me during the pregnancy, but the reality was a real letdown. As days turned into weeks, and my morning sickness faded, Simon started coming home later, and seemed more distant. He didn't check in on me much, and I felt more and more uneasy. But with everything I was going through, Confronting him wasn't on my radar. Then, when I was nearly due, I saw something after a hospital visit that made my heart drop. Heading out to shop for baby stuff, I caught sight of Simon on a busy sidewalk. Right next to him was a young blonde woman, and they seemed close. Maybe it was a gut feeling. I couldn't shake the thought that they were more than friends. I lost them in the crowd, and my mood for shopping evaporated. I just headed home. Waiting for me was a text from Simon. Got held up at work again. Had he been distanced because of her? But the idea of him stepping out, especially with me being pregnant, seemed wild. Even though I was torn up inside, confronting him didn't feel right. Still, I couldn't ignore my doubts. So I dug into my pre-marriage saving and hired a private eye to tell my husband. With my due date only two weeks away, time was ticking. Then, two days out from the due date, I felt the first labor pains. I timed them, about 20 minutes apart. I thought I was going into labor, so I quickly contacted Simon to let him know that it seemed like the contractions had started. When I called the hospital, they said to come in when they were 10 minutes apart. Terrified and in pain, I kept texting Simon, begging him to get home, but nothing. When the contractions got closer, I dialed his number. What do you want? He sounded irritated. 
I have been texting. I'm in labor. Can you take me to the hospital? Pushing through the pain, I shouted. His answer was unbelievable. Can't do it. Swamped with work. Grab a cab. Are you serious? Your wife is having a baby here. Sorry, but look, I will swing by the hospital later. Just hold on until then. He hung up, sounding totally nonchalant. With no other choice, I called a cab and let my folks know, heading off to the hospital. I'd been in labor for hours, but Simon was nowhere to be found at the hospital. My mom, who had gotten there before him, tried to ease my pain by rubbing my back. I shifted painfully onto the delivery bed, and an hour later, through immense pain, our baby was born. Just as I heard her first cries, Simon walked in. She's here? Janet, I'm so sorry I missed it. The way he overdid his apology in front of my folks really got to me. But right after delivering, I was too wiped out to give him a piece of my mind. I watched, still feeling weak, as he acted all fatherly, holding our little girl. A couple of days later, Simon's family dropped by. Janet! You did amazing. How are you holding up? His mom asked, showing genuine concern, while his sister gifted us something for the baby. His dad looked pretty proud, saying, Whoa, doesn't she look like Simon as a baby? Simon, though, looked conflicted. We named our baby girl Tina. After I was discharged, Simon drove us home, and I was met with a messy house. Dirty clothes everywhere, in a sink full of dishes. Simon, why didn't you clean up? I burst it out, but all he did was shrug. Figured you'd handle it when you got back. I just had a baby, and I'm still healing, and I have to take care of her. He just looked annoyed and said, Whatever, I'm out of here. On a Sunday? Where to? Work. I won't be back till late. He took off, leaving me stunned with Tina in my arms. His routine stayed the same. He would come home only to crash, never helping with Tina. I was on my own for everything, feeding, bathing, bedtime. A few days into this routine, I got a call from a detective with some info to share. Since I couldn't really get around, I asked her to come over. The evidence she showed me was shocking. How could he pull something like this during my pregnancy? That evening, I did something to the unsuspecting sleeping Simon. Luckily, he didn't notice a thing. A month after Tina's arrival, we threw a little get-together. We got food and spruced up the living room a bit. Both our parents came over, totally taken by Tina. As we took some photos, our folks showered her with affection. Simon's sister showed up a bit late. Just as we were about to eat, Simon stood up. Hey everyone, I've got some news. Sadly, we're getting a divorce. Everyone, including his sister, was dumbfounded. So was I. Hold on, what's this about? I managed to ask, clutching Kim. Simon pointed right at me. She's the reason. She has been seeing someone else behind my back. My parents shot me a shocked look as he said this. I shot back immediately. I've never cheated on you. Grinning, he pulled out an envelope. I had my doubt, so I got a DNA test. This kid? She's not mine. She cheated, so we are splitting up. The report he waved around read, Parent-child relationship denied. Everyone's eyes were on me, disbelief all around. That was it. Enough was enough. He wanted to play this game in front of our families? Come on. Janet, is Dina really not Simon's? His dad asked, clearly upset. 
Come on, Janet. Be straight with us. My parents started, but I quickly pulled out the paper. Please, everyone, look here. This is a real DNA result for Simon and Tina. And there it was in black and white. A 99.9999% parent-child match. Everyone in the room was stunned by what had just been revealed. Simon, clearly freaking out, exclaimed, What the heck is that? I never provided any sample. It's gotta be fake. I swapped your mouse while you were sleeping. The result clearly matched you. But hey, if you're doubting it, let's do another test right here, right now. Simon, after being lost for words, spat out. Why even get a DNA test? You thought so too, right? That Tina was from another man. Just listen for a sec. I said, hitting the play button on my voice recorder. What played next was a conversation between Simon and some other woman. Nellie, once the divorce is final, you and me, we're gonna be together. Really, Simon? Even with your wife having a baby and all? Is that cool? Came her reply. I've got a plan. I'm going to make it look like she's the one who cheated. I will pay some random guy for a DNA sample. Once I have the result, I will divorce her and get some cash. Genius, Simon. We'll need that money to start fresh. The silence followed the playback. I can't even. His dad began, visibly shaken, while his mom looked went pale. I spread out some photos for everyone to see. Shot of Simon and Nelly going into a hotel. As you can see, He's been sneaking around with a co-worker, even while I was pregnant. I had a PI collect all of this. I let out. You knew? Simon cried out. I fixed him with a glare. Of course I knew. The only cheater here is you, jerk. And just when he looked totally lost, my sister-in-law, the athletic type, jumped up and punched him in the face. Seriously, sis? Guess you forgot about my black belt, huh? What the heck were you thinking? Say you're sorry to Janet and to her mom and dad right now. She punched him again, forcing him to apologize, while both our families looked on in shock. Out of breath, he stammered. Janet, I messed up, big time. But I swear I do love you. Please, give me another chance. Taking a moment, I said, Who in their right mind would forgive a guy who cheats and then makes such a sick plan? We are done. Just pay up and get out of my life, loser. Please. His parents kept apologizing over and over to me and my folk. My sister-in-law yanked him out of the room, color in hand. After that, our divorce went through with Simon's bank account taking the biggest hit. We settled on a monthly child support deal. I made sure to send evidence of Simon's affair to his and Nellie's employers. Word got around their company fast, which led to her quitting and Simon getting demoted. He became infamous as the guy who stepped out on his pregnant wife, but he was stuck working there to cover the child support. His family apologized nonstop and said they were cutting ties with him, with his family, his reputation, and his savings all gone. Simon is now slugging it out in his own personal nightmare. And honestly, I couldn't care less. He's getting what he deserves. As for me, I've been living it up, raising Tina near my parents. They've been a huge help with her, and I'm thinking of jumping back into work soon. From here on out, it's all about enjoying the little moments with him and living my best life. My son discovered his dad's affair, researched cheating father behavior over winter break, and presented it in class. My science project title is The Behavior of Cheating Fathers. 
That's what my son announced during his sixth-grade class presentation, where my husband and I were attending. When our son's name was called, he confidently walked to the blackboard and pinned up a large poster. The room went silent for a moment, then erupted in murmurs. Undeterred, our son began presenting. I chose this topic because on December tenth. Right before winter break, I saw my dad walking arm in arm with a woman I didn't recognize. I noticed more suspicious behavior after that, so I decided to research my own dad. From the back of the room, I stared at the poster, filled with numerous photos and detailed research findings. I realized it all: my husband's late nights and his distance from our family. He had been cheating. I was seething inside. I wouldn't stand for this. I shot my husband a glare and demanded, "What is this about?" He looked back, pale and trembling. "Stay with me to see how this story unfolds." My name is Emily, a forty-year-old working mom. I've been with the cosmetics company I joined right out of college. I've recently been promoted to a manager position, and I'm finding it fulfilling. My husband's name is James. We met 14 years ago through a mutual friend. He's set to inherit his father's business and currently works in sales. Despite his occasional recklessness, he's promising and gentle, drawing me closer over time. After dating for two years, I happily accepted his dreamy proposal. Emily, let's build a happy family together. Ah,、uh, James. Once we are married, I'd love to have kids soon. Hopefully, a boy as an heir. Always in a rush, aren't you, James? We then began visiting our parents to announce our engagement. My rural folks loved James. Then it was time to meet his parents, Samuel, a company CEO, and Barbara, a housewife. Their lavish home was intimidating, making me nervous. Don't be tense, Emily. Barbara comforted. We are delighted to meet you. She serves us tea, and seems like a very sweet lady. When James expressed our intent to marry, they were overjoyed. A family will make you a real man, James. Treat Emily well. Despite his stern appearance, Samuel was kind. I am glad to be joining such a lovely family. I replied, and Barbara warmly agreed. They even supported my decision to continue working post marriage. It's an era where women excel in their careers, Samuel pointed out. On our way home, James said, "It seems my folks really liked you." Your parents are wonderful. Dad is usually strict, but what scares me more is Mom. When she's mad, it's terrifying. I was surprised. Really? We better not upset her then. Don't worry. She seemed fond of you. Following our lavish wedding, we began living in the apartment Samuel gifted us. With James often away due to work, house chores largely fell to me. Juggling my job and housework was challenging, but modern appliances made it manageable. Thankfully, he helped out occasionally, so I wasn't too frustrated. A year after we got married, I discovered I was pregnant. Hearing the news, James was ecstatic, jumping for joy. Oh my gosh, Emily! I'm going to be a dad. Thank you. My in-laws were just as thrilled as he was. Take care of yourself, Emily. We'll do whatever we can to help. With teary eyes, my mother-in-law tightly grasped my hands, while behind her, my father-in-law couldn't hide his joyful smile. I genuinely felt grateful to have them as my in-laws. My parents live in the countryside, farming, so I don't see them often. During my pregnancy, Barbara took such good care of me. Thanks to her support, my pregnancy went smoothly, and I gave birth without any issues 
to a lovely baby boy. Seeing the relief on the faces of my husband and the in-laws, I said to Barbara, "Would you like to hold the baby?" Taking the baby, she exclaimed with delight, "Oh, how adorable!" Have you already decided on his name, Emily? We discussed it and decided on Noah. What a beautiful name, little Noah! Nice to meet you. I'm Grandma Barbara. Now let's say hi to Grandpa. At that moment, my husband and I truly felt surrounded by familial bliss. Twelve years have passed since then. And Noah is now in sixth grade, though he's become a bit distant compared to when he was always following me around, saying "Mom, Mom." He's grown into a kind and intelligent boy. We've maintained a great relationship with my in-laws. They've been understanding of my work commitments, even looking after young Noah on my behalf and frequently checking in with me. They adore him. Sometimes spoiling him a bit too much, and he seems to love them in return. However, one thing has changed: my relationship with James. We still live together, occasionally bickering, but generally getting along. However, over the past year, he has become unusually distant towards both me and Noah. James, having climbed the corporate ladder to become a sales director and potentially the next successor, has been increasingly absent from home, studying and busy with work. He rarely speaks to Noah and usually just drinks and goes to sleep at home. This has been the routine for a while. As our son entered his last winter break in elementary school, I suggested to James, who came home late. How about we go on a winter vacation? It would be nice for Noah. James, looking bothered, replied, "I'm swamped with work. I don't have time for that." But you've been like this for a while, and I feel bad for Noah. He's at that age where he doesn't want his parents around, right? Just let him be. He retorted dismissively and quickly went to sleep. I felt both disappointed and lonely with his response. The next day, as Noah helped me with the dishes, I told him, "I'm sorry, Noah. We might not be able to go on a trip this year, but we can visit the museum or something. Okay? It's okay, Mom. You just focus on your work." He replied nonchalantly. I wondered if James was right about him preferring the company of friends over parents now. But you have your project, right? Let me know if there is anything I can help with. I've already decided on my research project topic. I want to focus on that. I see. Well, I won't bother you then. Good luck with it. Though he still had some childlike traits, I felt proud of how mature he had become. Throughout the winter break, James was busy with work, and I was tied up too. So Noah spent more time at his grandparents. He seemed engrossed in his assignments and research, staying in his room most of the day. However, we made sure to share dinner together every evening and chat. I believe our mother-son relationship remained strong. Occasionally, I noticed him looking at me as if he wanted to say something, but I decided to wait until he was ready to talk. And just like that, winter break came to an end, and after a little while, the last open class session of elementary school approached. I decided to ask my father-in-law to have James take the day off from work so he could join me for the class visitation. James seemed hesitant and a bit annoyed, but upon my urging, he entered the classroom. The main event for the open class was for each student to present the independent research they had conducted during the break. One by one, the kids presented their findings, like observation of plants or their own handmade crafts. As I watched them with a smile and clapped, 
a thought struck me. Noah had seemed really engrossed in his independent research, but what was he going to present? He confidently stood in front of the chalkboard and pinned a large poster to it. The title of my research is The Behavior of a Cheating Father. The classroom went silent for a moment, and then suddenly everyone began whispering. Regardless, Noah calmly read out the contents of his poster. First, I'll explain why I chose this topic. On December 10th, just before winter break, I saw my dad walking arm in arm with a woman I didn't recognize. I noticed other suspicious behaviors, so I decided to research my own father. From the back of the classroom, I stared at the poster. It was filled with various photographs and densely written research findings. It all made sense to me then. The reason why my husband has been coming home late and had been so distant was because he had been cheating on me. I was seething. This is unforgivable. I immediately turned to my husband and demanded, What's this about? He looked pale and trembling. The teacher quickly interrupted Noah's presentation and even though he pleaded to continue, the teacher told him he couldn't. From the back, I called out to my son. Let's go home, Noah. I promise I'll listen to your entire presentation. Mom. With that, we left the classroom under the curious gazes of others. In the parking lot, I sharply told James, who was turning pale and trying to get into the car. You can walk home. I drove straight to my in-law's house with my son. What happened, Emily? Why isn't Noah in school? Barbara exclaimed while her husband looked on with a puzzled look. To them I said, Please, take a look at Noah's research. I had him spread out his poster on the table. I hadn't been able to see it from the back of the classroom, but the contents were incredibly detailed. It included sections like Observing my father's day, with notes like Leaves for work at 8.30 a.m., leaves office around 10 a.m. with a new female co-worker. They head to a cafe and flirt, return to the office after lunch, leave again at 1.30 p.m., and go to a hotel, then dinner at a restaurant. There were photos he took himself, even one of his father coming out of the hotel. My in-laws were stunned. Oh my goodness. We should confirm this with James. After they reviewed everything, including sections on identifying woman A, recording my father's weekend activities, differences in my father's behavior at home and with A, and text messages between my father and A, Samuel finally said with a shaky voice, Noah, this is very well done, and that's commendable. Thank you, Grandpa. But, Noah, why didn't you tell your mother about this? Noah, with a quivering voice, responded, I thought it would make Mom sad, but I couldn't stand it. I found online that if I wanted to accuse someone, I needed evidence, so that's why I did this. Tears streamed down his face. Holding him tight, I said, It's okay, Noah. Thank you. I promise I'll protect you. I'm stronger than I might seem. I'm sorry, Mom, but I can't see him as my dad anymore. I nodded, took him home, and made him dinner. Later, when I received a call from Samuel, I headed back to their house. In the living room, James sat with visibly angered Samuel and his mother, who was also as mad. Spread out on the table was Noah's project. Now that we are all here, James, explain this. Samuel said in a low voice, This... this is a misunderstanding of Noah's part. I confronted him. A misunderstanding, you say? Then what about this photo of you entering the hotel? 
Are you saying that Noah just made this up? That's uh. Oh, and this lady here, Abigail Walker. She's a new employee in your department at work, huh? I even have screenshots of your chats. I love you, Abby. Can't wait to be with you tomorrow. We're going to get married, Abby. Then you be Mrs. CEO. Ah, isn't that sweet? Please, just stop. He finally admitted, defeated. All right, all right. I admit, I cheated on you. It's pretty obvious when it's laid out like this. I can't believe Noah found out. Holding his head in his hands, he looked up. His father informed him. I heard from your deputy manager. Everyone in the company has known about your affair with the new girl, but they were too scared of your position to say anything. What? Using the company car for your rendezvous during business hours? Unbelievable! You're fired, and so is she. James pointed at himself in disbelief. Even though I'm the next CEO, who said I'd let you take over? Shame on you, you disgraceful son, Dad. Suddenly, his mother, who had been silent till now, slapped him hard across his face. Ow, Mom! What the hell? You disgrace! Apologize to Emily and Noah right now. We are cutting ties with you. Never show sure your face again. She continued to slap him multiple times until her husband intervened. All right, that's enough. True to her reputation, James was most afraid of his mother. With a face flushed from the slaps, he staggered over to me. Emily, I'm sorry. Please, if you forgive me, everything can be fixed. Please forgive me. With all the strength I had, I shouted back, "Are you out of your mind? You didn't just betray me, but also left a scar on Noah's heart. We are getting a divorce. I'll be claiming alimony and child support. So brace yourself, you jerk. Go to hell." Samuel threw James out. Our divorce was finalized smoothly thanks to the evidence Noah had collected. I demanded alimony and child support from him in a lump sum, which he quickly paid, especially with the pressure from his parents. As promised, his father really fired both James and his mistress. I also claimed compensation from the mistress, but since she had no savings, her parents paid on her behalf and took her back to the countryside. I heard that she and James broke up over the money dispute. James, having lost all his savings, his job, and being disowned by his parents, eventually vanished. Rumor has it, he's now living in a rundown apartment in the neighboring state, taking up odd jobs. I don't feel sorry for him one bit. He got what he deserved. As for me, I'm still living near my in-laws' place with Noah. Our relationship with them remains unchanged, and they often spend time with Noah. He has declared that he'll take over his grandfather's company, to which he responded with evident joy. As I move forward, I'm grateful for the unwavering support from my in-laws, and look forward to enjoying every moment of my son's growth. A birthday surprise for my husband turned into a scandal when he didn't show up. I caught him cheating on camera and exposed it to the company. Over time again, hasn't it been too frequent lately? I pointed out my husband's excessive overtime. My husband runs a vegetable wholesaling company. I've been working alongside him to support the business. However. Recently, he had me working late into the night every day. I was concerned about his excessive overtime. That's why I brought it up. But my husband frowned and responded irritably, "Shut up! There's no helping it. The recent high prices are affecting us. I'm working hard to protect our company, 
So don't complain. Then I will help with the overtime. When I suggested that, my husband widened his eyes and shook his head in a fluster. No, you should go home and rest. I'm enough by myself. I can concentrate better when I'm working alone. He spoke as if I were a hindrance, which secretly irritated me. But I heard that the business similar to ours fell victim to a robbery. Working alone late into the night during such times, when I mentioned that, my husband chuckled. It's just a coincidence that another business was targeted. You worry too much. It's annoying when you are like that. Forget about me and go home to sleep. You're getting in the way of work. My husband pushed me out of the office. Reluctantly, I said, take care, and left. But I couldn't help but worry. Maybe I should install more security cameras and take precautions. While pondering this, I looked back at the office. That's when I noticed some moving shadows in the darkness. What is that? Ah, my name is Violet, and I'm 39 years old. I currently run a vegetable wholesaling company with my husband Frank. We had an arranged marriage. And our relationship has been relatively good. My late in-laws also appreciated and cherished me, saying that a capable daughter-in-law had come. Thanks to that, I was well regarded by those around me at my husband's company. After my father-in-law passed away, my mother-in-law and the board members had a discussion, and decided to have my husband and me take over the company. There was a strong trust from the employees. And they would sometimes jokingly say things like, "As long as Violet is here, everything will be fine." Even after my mother-in-law passed away, my husband and I worked hard, even though we had our disagreements at times. On this day, I had been complaining to my husband when I arrived at work. Since my husband didn't help with household chores. I ended up expressing my discontent in a stern tone. In response, one of the employees jokingly remarked, "The president is completely under Violet's control, isn't he? I'm not really bossing him around. I'm just asking him to take out the trash before going to work. And putting socks in the washing machine without rolling them up is something obvious, right?" When I complained like that to the employees. My husband genuinely apologized. My bad. I sometimes forget. I will make sure to do it next time. You always say that, but you never actually do it, right? I replied with a sigh. I often complain about household matters and such, and perhaps it's because of these frequent exchanges that I've intentionally earned the reputation of being a controlling wife. However. When it comes to actual work, I intend to be aware of my place. I was serious about my work on the field, but I also provided strong support for my husband, who had a tendency to be easily swayed in his role as a company's president. Around the beginning of May, my husband informed me that he wanted to talk. In the office, he had an unusually serious expression on his face. What's this talk about? Actually, I'm thinking of hiring this person. There is a resume on the desk. The resume photo is of an attractive but somewhat listless-looking woman. Checking her background, she's 45 years old, the same age as my husband, and attended the same primary and middle schools. Do you happen to know her? Oh yes, she's Margaret. She's my childhood friend. I bumped into her the other day. She's a divorcee, and it seems she returned to her hometown with her child last month. She's a single mother, you see. She mentioned that she's been struggling to find a job and is having a hard time. I thought I would give her a helping hand due to our old friendship. I listened to my husband's words and offered my input. Looking at her background alone. She seemed like a suitable fit for our company. She seems to have some office experience from her temp jobs, 
and I believe she can do the job. What do you think? Well, I think it's a good idea. However, let's start her with warehouse work like the other new employees. I convey my thoughts, and my husband nods with relief. His childhood friend, who joined the company as a mid career hire, quickly became friendly and familiar with her new colleagues. Looks like she will fit in well. That's good. I feel relieved observing Margaret's demeanor, but I was still troubled at the office. The reason for my concern was the recent impact of rising prices, which had been giving both sellers and buyers a headache. As I reviewed the financial records, a sigh escaped naturally. My husband had been working late at the company after employees had left quite often lately. Sometimes he even worked late into the next day. This had been going on for about a month, and I couldn't help but worry. Moreover, time? Isn't it getting excessive lately? I pointed out my husband's frequent overtime. However, he frowned deeply and responded with irritation. Shut up! There's nothing I can do about it. It's because of this inflation. I'm working hard to protect our company, so don't complain. He retorts with a raised voice. Lately, it seemed like he was getting more irritable and annoyed when I talked to him, possibly due to stress. Then maybe I should stay and help with the overtime. When I offered, my husband's eyes widened, and he shook his head in a fluster. No, really. You should go home and rest. I can manage on my own. I can concentrate better when working alone. It felt like he was implying that I was a hindrance when I was around. My husband disliked me staying for overtime. He believed that he could work more efficiently alone. But I heard recently that a similar business got robbed. Isn't it dangerous to be here all alone so late at night? The theft targeted the safe and the goods that were supposed to be transported. And it was said that thieves were after money and food. I shivered at the thought of the worsening security situation. If my husband kept working late all along, there was a risk of becoming a target. I suggested it might be better to finish work earlier, but my husband just chuckled. It's just a coincidence that another business in the same industry got targeted. There is no guarantee it will be next. You worry too much. It's irritating. Forget about me and go home and get some rest. You're getting in the way of my work. But... You're being too persistent. Can you listen to the company present me? Since when did you become the boss here? My husband pushed me out of the office in frustration. There was no point in arguing with him when he was in this mood. Reluctantly, I said, take care, and went outside. But I couldn't help but worry. Our budget was tight under the current circumstances, but maybe we should consider increasing the number of security cameras. While thinking about that, I looked back at the office. That's when I noticed something moving in the darkness. I didn't think it was a gang of robbers. Ah! Uh -huh. Startles. I froze in place, but then I heard a cat's meow coming from the moving shadow. It was just a cat. It looked like a shadow of a person to me. It seemed like I had been on edge due to our earlier discussion about robbers. Relieved, I made my way home. The installation of the security cameras was scheduled when my husband was on a business trip. He would likely oppose it. So this was a convenient time. With the increased number of cameras, I felt a bit more at ease. A few days later, there was a personal change for Margaret. My husband had mentioned that due to a shortage of staff, Margaret, who had office experience, would be transferred to an office position, and that decision had been officially made. I felt a bit uneasy about this sudden personnel change, but it was my husband's decision. I didn't plan to make a fuss about it. In reality, Margaret seems willing to take an overtime work which my husband found helpful. It bothered me a little, 
that my husband opposed me working overtime, but was fine with Margaret. Frank had mentioned that working with non-family members created a sense of professionalism and made it easier than working overtime as a couple. I tilted my head, observing my husband's behavior. On a certain day, for my husband's birthday, I was waiting at home with a few employees to surprise him. Hearing it was a surprise party, even people from the same industry like my uncle Milton, who was my father-in-law's brother, and executives from our regular clients came over. We used to have surprise parties like this quite often in the past. Every time, my husband would be surprised, but also very happy. This month, with the efforts of all our employees, we finally started making a little profit. I thought it was a good time for a somewhat grand party. Today, I had confirmed that my husband didn't have too much work, but he still hadn't come back. I apologize for keeping everyone waiting. I told him to come back as early as possible today. Well, well, if he's busy, there's nothing we can do. He will be back soon. Despite what my uncle said, there was no sign of my husband returning. I called him several times, but he didn't answer. Is he taking too long? The rover hasn't been called yet, and I'm starting to worry. A sense of uneasy crossed my mind. Concerned, I remembered that I could check the footage from the security cameras I had recently installed using my smartphone. When I did, what is this? I stood there pale, shocked, and my employees looked at my phone in surprise. On my smartphone, there was a video of my husband engaging in an affair in his office. Upon closer inspection, it appeared that his affair partner was none other than Margaret. What's going on here? Even Milton, who was known for being devoted to his wife, looked disgusted, as if he was watching something filthy. Th this must be some kind of mistake. In a rush to remain calm, I accidentally turned up the volume on my phone. The indecent sounds of my husband and his affair partner filled the room and his infidelity was inadvertently exposed to the employees and important clients. Everyone stood there, their faces drained of color, at a loss for words. In this situation, there was no room for a surprise party. We decided to call it a night. The next morning, my husband came home late, and when I asked him what had happened, he casually replied, I was out with Milton and we were drinking late, and he let me stay over. Oh, with Milton, you say? Well, Milton was at our house last night. Anger welled up inside me, as my husband told that blatant lie. It seemed that he had been lying about working late for a while now. Frank wanted to get me out of the office as quickly as possible, because he wanted to meet with Margaret. I was in the way. I can't forgive him. Just watch. I've had enough. I hired a private detective to investigate the affair, and I had my employees look into Margaret's behavior at work. It turned out that she had been slacking off, arriving late, and there were even reports of her engaging in romantic behavior with my husband when they thought nobody was watching. Apparently, they thought no one at the company had noticed. What's more, that meal I heard outside the office, which I thought was a cat. It turns out it wasn't a cat at all. Margaret was imitating a cat to cover up her secret meetings with my husband. An employee who was still at the scene witnessed it all. The employee who witnessed the affair couldn't bring themselves to speak to me, probably out of concern. Finally, I handed the detective agency's report to my husband when he returned from work. What on earth is this? You are having an affair with Margaret, aren't you? You traitor! You're the worst! Wh what Why the sudden outburst? At first, my husband seemed shaken with a pale face, but he started to become more defiant when he realized he couldn't escape. Well, if I've been cold, there's no helping it. 
Yeah, that's right. Margaret, who is prettier than you and easier to get along with, is more appealing. You make it sound like it was all my fault in the first place, but it was you yourself who caused me to cheat on you. I'm sick and tired of your constant nagging. He began shifting the blame for his affair onto me, saying that it was my fault due to my nagging. I couldn't help but be infuriated by that. Don't blame others. The fact that you have a gullible personality is a root cause, isn't it? Shut up! It's because of your nagging that I got sick of it. If you have a problem, I will divorce you right now. I will even fire you from the company. My husband became angry and threatened to divorce and fire me. Fine. Understood. I had been prepared for such wars and had already packed my belongings. With only the essentials, I left the house and moved to a hotel. A week later, I was awakened by a barrage of phone calls from my husband. I ignored the call, but it persisted, so I had no choice but to answer it and my husband sounded impatient over the phone. Hey, what's going on here? All the employees have quit. Is this your doing? I haven't done anything. It's entirely the employee's decision. They can't follow you anymore. So I've already arranged jobs for them at Milton's company. My husband was left speechless by my words. It appears that the employees noticed Margaret who was initially a friendly and hard-working person, undergo a drastic change in attitude since the time my husband started having an affair. They seem to be harboring resentment toward my husband for being aware of her deteriorating work attitude and silently tolerating it. The strain from work had taken its toll and the employees couldn't bear it any longer. At that point, when my husband fired me, they had had enough of him. Even our major client decided they couldn't continue their deals with us. And so, my husband's company went bankrupt. I divorced him without any sympathy and managed to get a decent amount of compensation. It wasn't a fortune, but it felt like the perfect final blow. Later, I heard that Margaret seems to have approached my ex-husband for money. Perhaps because of his position as a small-scale CEO, she assumed he had a lot of wealth. Margaret seems to have had a man who was supporting her financially. A man who was, in fact, a member of the recently infamous gang of robbers that got arrested. She was arrested for hiding that man. I had heard that Margaret was a single mother, but I wondered what had happened to her child. It turned out that Margaret had pretended to be a single mother to gain sympathy from my ex-husband. She had claimed that her child was in a sensitive phase of adolescence and thus had him not to meet the child. Due to this, my ex-husband was unaware of the truth. In reality, Margaret's ex-husband had been raising the child, and Margaret and the child were estranged. Furthermore, my ex-husband had been burdened with Margaret's death. Frank is really a gullible man. It appeared he had been coerced into taking on Margaret's death, depleting his savings almost entirely. A while later, I heard a rumor from a former employee that they had seen what seems to be my ex-husband as a homeless person near the company's former location. After that, I was entrusted with a subsidiary of Milton's company and gradually improved its performance. The employees continued to work comfortably, almost as they used to. The somewhat unfunny tale of discovering a thief inside while implementing external security measures remains a topic of discussion to this day.